HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Okay, parachutes ready. Boy, the things I go through to get on all on rates as low as 0.99% APR for 60 months on new vehicles with PenFed. You are aware that you don't have to be a military member to save hundreds on your auto loan, aren't you? Anyone can join PenFed. As someone terrified of heights, I probably should have looked into that. Probably. Drop me off at the shore. PenFed Credit Union. Visit PenFed.org slash autos or call 1-800-247-5626. Advertised rates available through the PenFed car buying service. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast is enjoying inclusion on lists of the best podcasts to listen to and is gaining recognition as a resource for small business owners, sales professionals, entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs. Um, really, it, we're really just thrilled and honored that we are showing up on places like MSNBC's Your Business, Inc.com, um, Fit Small Business, Proven. There's a whole bunch of sites, uh, those included, but there, there are even more. It's been interesting that are really uh, adding this podcast to their list because we are thrilled and always interested in the guests that we get, these folks who give their expertise, give their time, they come on, we have a great conversation, they share their knowledge with all of you so that you can take that information back into your business and do great things. So uh, we continue to look for people like that because that's the mission that we're on, and we have someone just like that with us today. My guest is Willard Barth. Willard has been involved in the field of human behavior, personal and professional development for close to 30 years. The biggest lesson Willard learned from his time developing numerous businesses in various industries was that for a business to be successful, they had to follow a repetitive cycle, which he labels the anatomy of transformation. Along with his accomplishments in the field of personal development, 
Willard has used these skills to his benefit in many other areas of his life. He's the founder of three successful companies, including an entertainment company, a marketing company, as well as Willard Barth Enterprises. A successful singer-songwriter, his first album, Coming Home, enjoyed international success with the first single, Wind Dancer, reaching 24 on the pop charts overseas. He also performed regularly on Broadway with the legendary Les Paul. Now that you're all jealous, let's listen to more. He co-founded and was the president of the Seventh Power, which is a New Jersey-based nonprofit organization promoting empowerment and charitable support to the community, and he currently sits on the boards of two other nonprofits. Thank you so much for being with me today, Willard. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Well, I, I am I'm thrilled, and hey, congratulations on uh, the album and and just everything you are really rocking it in just about every avenue of existence it's great thank you thank you it's, it's funny one of my one of my consulting uh, associates that we do some work with that's a bomb that he usually drops with our clients that we're meeting with he goes and now we have a rock star in the building a true rock star <laughs> and uh, you know when you're sitting with a bunch of c-level managers they're looking around like what in the world are you talking about so it's, uh, but it is, it is a part of my history and part of what actually helped me become um, as proficient as I am in the consulting world because the music business is a business. So, yes, yes, good for you. That's, that is exactly right, which, you know, a lot of times entertainers don't realize. Yeah. So, I, I love this concept of anatomy of transformation. Um, and I want, can you share with us what led you to the development? of this concept? Yeah, absolutely. It was actually a uh, conversation with uh, one of my mentors. I had, I, I travel to speak, as you know, and I also do business consulting and, and coaching and those things. And really the, the speaking is lead generation for a lot of the consulting business. And I had taken some time off the road uh, back around 2008 to 2013 because my elderly mother I needed to actually move her in with me and help take care of her and I was getting ready to go back out on the road a couple of years ago and was having a conversation with my mentor that I just wanted to find something that was new to to reach out and, and speak about and promote because I felt but I just didn't want to go back out and be regurgitating the things that I've been doing you know pre-2008 and he asked me a question he said you know, Willard, there's many people who have overcome cancer in their lives, who have overcome drug and alcohol addiction, who have overcome being a quarter of a million dollars in debt, who have overcome being in jail, who have overcome being homeless. He goes, but there's not many people who have overcome them all. And now who teaches and helps other businesses get great results? So he asked me, what, what were the organizing principles that number one allowed me to get the results that I got for myself personally, but two that I utilized with my clients to help them get results. And that led to a, a multi-month uh, introspection to go, okay, what really are the organizing principles? What, what was it that allowed me to achieve these things? And what is it that really is the foundation that I'm working with with my clients. And I, I uncovered these, these seven phases that are a part of every transformation. It doesn't matter to me whether it's a business transformation, a relationship, a health issue, uh, a life issue. These seven phases of transformation are the framework of how we all go from where we are to where we desire to be. Really? Yes. Well, so... Um... Let's talk about a couple of them. I mean, if you sure. would like name them, and I, I don't, you don't need to, you know, tell us about all of them. But let, let right. you know, let, let's talk about some of them. Um, sure. Just to give people an idea of of what you're talking about. Cause I, this is really fascinating to me. So, well, what are uh, they? I'll use the the first phase is what I call ignorance. Now, when I first started using that as a term, many of my associates in the business world were like, okay, you want to change that from a marketing and branding perspective because nobody <laughs> wants to admit that they're ignorant. And I'm like, but the reality is for all of us, there is a point where we, we have no knowledge of this thing that's going on. 
You know, I mean, we can be a person who's starting up a business. We have no idea. What do you have to do to create the legal entity for your business and which entity should it be? We have no idea of what our brand identity is. We, we have no idea of what a strategic plan is. Everybody starts in a place of ignorance. They don't even know that they don't know certain things. And that's not just when you're starting your business. I, I, I talk about in, in, uh, in my presentations and things about one of our clients, this, uh, this gentleman had been in business for 30 years. He took over a family run business that had been in business for 30 years. And he was living the life of his dreams, literally. He was living in Italy, sending his kids to school in Europe, which is what he always wanted to do. His, his company was based in New Jersey. Company was generating $32 million a year in revenue. Not bad. You know, I mean, that's where most people will be happy with their lives. But he was ignorant of the fact that he had reached a status and a, and a, and a status quo on a level that his managers and the people that were working for the company were not happy with because it was not stretching them. It was not challenging them. It was not, you know, calling to them to be more. And he was getting ready to lose some of his key players. Hmm. So, Ignorance shows up in many different places, and it's not a derogative term. It's just saying that you don't know. You're not, you're not aware. And right. awareness is the second phase of transformation. Hmm. You know, we, we become aware either through the pain that shows up from our ignorance or we become aware because, example, um, I, I, I have to imagine that many of the people who, who listen to your show, some of them when they were young, really had no idea that they had the opportunity to become an entrepreneur, to become a business owner. You know, I grew up in a, in a part of the country where the belief was factory workers, kids became factory workers, kids, doctors, kids became doctors. You know, it was your, it was your, uh, I forget the, the, the old word that they used to use for it, but that was what you were uh, prescribed to be when you were growing up. And then finally, I was sitting in an in a, in a interview one day for a job just out of college, and the gentleman says, the only way that you'll ever reach a level of financial freedom is either through sales or owning your own business. And this is the first person that made me aware that I could do either of those things. You know, it was like, wait a minute, I could actually own a business? I thought you just got those things from your parents handing them down to you and things like that. I was 20 years old and an intelligent person. You know, to, to, to have that mindset, it, it, it you know, it, I wasn't, I wasn't stupid, but nobody had ever made me aware of other options. So phase two is, uh, is awareness. Phase three is where transformation begins to take place though, because awareness does not lead to transformation. Many times people use awareness as their excuse or as their story of why they can't do something. You know, I can't because X happened to me as a child or because I don't have the money or because my family didn't do anything. Phase three of transformation is where you actually take responsibility. You take responsibility for where you are and stop blaming everybody else for where you are. You know, you can't blame the economy. You can't blame a previous business partner. You can't blame, you know, a manager who didn't run your business right. You're the one who's responsible. And then that allows you to take responsibility for where you go in the future. Uh, phase four is what I call immersion. How deeply committed are you to the process? Are you just going to try or is there no other option than succeeding? Phase five is what I call interdependence. You know, uh, I used to think that one of the ways that I had succeeded and overcame many things was by tapping into my personal strength. And what I realized was that was basically a lot of BS because the way that I succeeded was by standing on the shoulders of others, by learning from those who had gone before me, and that my success all came from little pieces of the tapestry of what I learned from other mentors, whether these were mentors that I paid to coach me, whether they were people I worked for, or whether it was somebody that I sat down and had a cup of coffee with who, who shared you know, these gems with me. Uh, phase six is what I call ownership where you finally have taken all of those different pieces from all of those different teachers and you've now melded it into the uniqueness of who you are. And then phase seven is influence where you now are, it doesn't mean you have to become a teacher or you have to become a coach or those things, but by having transformed your own life, your own business, your own situation, you now are able to influence and transform others. Wow. 
That that is so interesting. I um, would actually like to go back to interdependence for a minute. Sure, sure. Okay, so I I found that fascinating um, because, and I'm I'm just wondering what you think about this. It seems to me that what stops a lot of people, and they don't even realize that it's stopping them, is this belief that they're supposed to have all the answers. Right. They're supposed to Absolutely. know, like, right? I'm the president. I'm Absolutely. the owner. I'm the fill in the blank. So I I need to have all of the solutions, and they can't. So they don't Abs- grow Absolutely. or progress, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The, those those are the ones that that I that I actually choose not to deal with when it comes to clients. Those are the ones who are not coachable. You know, yeah. where they think they have to have it all. And I mean, the, the, the most successful people I know always are crediting their mentors and, and the people that they've learned from. And they're constantly also always looking for that one idea that's going to make things better. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Right. They. Yeah. That. That's really, that is great. That mm-hmm. I, I totally get that, that, that really Hit me, and I love this thing about um, taking responsibility because I think that's mm-hmm. also something that th- there are people who, uh, you know, it's a blame game. It's a I can't because mm-hmm. sort of thing, right? But yes. but I thought that yep. was interesting. So let's talk about awareness too, because I thought that was interesting. Where, you know, when you talked about it, you said that is often the place where people stop. Like that, the awareness yes. doesn't necessarily forward moving. Right. Yeah, awareness awareness just brings you out of the ignorance phase. What you do with it from that point will determine whether transformation happens or whether you live a life of of regret. Um, you know, so many people, the awareness becomes I I, I say their story or their excuse. Oh well, I, I see. I can't start a business because I don't have the money. I don't have the knowledge. I don't know how to write a business plan. I don't know how to create a prototype. I don't know how to get a patent. And rather than going, okay, I'm gonna find out how. i Google is a great resource to get me started, you know. Or you know, who do I know that's in my personal network that um, that I can go and ask some questions to, you know? Because people feel. I mean, human behavior is an amazing thing. It fascinates me. I love studying it. And it's just that thing of, you know, so many people look at another person's situation, you know, so they compare themselves to you because of, you know, your success and, and you're having the radio show and doing all these things. Or they compare themselves to me and what they see of where I am now 30, 30 years into the game. Right. And they don't realize those incremental steps that we had to take. So they think, oh, well, Willard already knew this. Diane all, always had that level of success. Right. And, and they're like, oh, the only way I succeed is if this was already in my DNA. And they, they just, they, they give up before they even start the game. Um, I, want, I want to circle back to take responsibility sure. for a second, though, also if I can. You know, taking responsibility, when I say about you need to take responsibility for how you got where you are, isn't only the blame game. A lot of people do the blame game, but it's also taking responsibility for your successes. Yeah. You know, so many people, they, they, they play that small. It's like, oh, I was lucky. Oh, this happened. Oh, that happened. No, you made specific decisions. And you took specific actions. You are the one who did the work. And you need to acknowledge that for yourself. Take responsibility and pat yourself on the back. You know, the same way that you need to take responsibility and not blame people, you need to acknowledge, you know what? I'm the one who came up with that idea. I'm the one who actually made those decisions and had to take responsibility for them. I'm the one who stayed up those late hours. I'm the one who sought out the mentor. I'm the one who drove an hour and a half to go to that to that networking group that ended up teaching me the information. We need to acknowledge those things because those are the resources, those are the character traits that will allow us to be successful. And when we, again, take responsibility for how we got where we are now, then it gives us more power to take responsibility for where we're going in the future. I totally hear that. It's funny. I think think about that often because most people – 
that I meet are not comfortable accepting praise or, Mm -hmm. you know, acknowledging, they may acknowledge their accomplishments, but, but really appreciating their accomplishments as accomplishments. And sometimes I think it's because, like, I know I was raised to be humble, right? To not toot my own horn and all that stuff. And I think it is actually a little bit detrimental to my Mm -hmm. growth in business because I'm not comfortable shining that light, right? Like, it's easy for me to read the thing at the beginning of this because, I don't know, I'm reading it and and whatever. But, you know, when you're out trying to really pitch yourself, people, like, you fall back on that. Oh, I shouldn't, you know, then then I'm being egotistical. Yep. Yep. I, I, I see that so much. You remind me, um, there was actually a training that I was doing. Um, God, it was just back in October. Yes, October. It's a weekend training event that we were doing. And one of the students that was there, we were talking about this thing of needing to, we were talking about, you know, what differentiates you from the competition. Yeah. And her thing was, she goes, well, I haven't overcome these major things that you know all these other people in the room have overcome it's like okay but what are your successes that differentiates you also well, i haven't succeeded you know at anything the way that these people have succeeded and it's like all right stand up change your state i want you to get yourself you know in in that place of just that certainty of who you are and tell me some of the things that you've done in your career and she started naming off these things and the more she did it i mean this woman had a laundry list of seven or eight things that were outstanding that she'd achieved, but she, she wasn't realizing that these were things that, that really did differentiate her from everyone else. You know, I came from the, the same background, don't blow your own horn, modesty, all these types of things, you know, but uh, the, the reality is, again, I believe that we need to take credit for those things. One of my, one of my coaches that, uh, that I work with, you know, he he uh, went off on me one day in a very loving and fun way about, you know, I need to celebrate every time that I do something that is now for me a habit that did not used to be because it was the choices that I made to make these things a part of my character. And I need to acknowledge them when I catch myself doing these things. And it was as simple enough, or this may not sound simple, I don't, I don't know, but I'm just feeling compelled to share it, was there was a, a call that we were doing something, and uh, when he came onto the call, there was a group of us, and he asked how many people did this one exercise before we you know, came on the call. And I said, I'm going to be honest with you, for the past week, I have just been playing catch-up. I have been pushing so hard that... I'm like, I'm getting up five minutes before my first phone call, rolling over, going over my notes and getting in my phone call. I said, so I, I didn't get up that hour early to do this other ritual that I needed to do ahead of time. He goes, that's outstanding. You need to celebrate that. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because you need to celebrate the fact that you're on a, uh, on a room, or excuse me, on a call with a group of peers that hold each other to a very high standard and you didn't lie. You didn't. You know, you didn't try and BS your way around it, make up excuses. You just said, look, I've been getting up. I got up five minutes before the call. I did not have the time to do that ritual before this. I'm like, but that's part of my character. I, I, I hold honesty as such a high thing. I would not lie to you. He goes, yeah, but were you always that way? He goes, we take for granted the growth that we've made. And we need to remember to celebrate those things that haven't been habits for us. We need to celebrate all the wins. We need to celebrate the little ones and the big ones because, you know, we've become a society that is so driven by the negativity. We need to remember to reward ourselves. We need to acknowledge ourselves. So, yeah, don't know yeah. if that took, took us off right. track. There, oh, but. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's a great, um, it's a great example. And I, Agree. Uh, really. I mean, when, when I talk to people about um, like plant ma- doing strategic planning or creating a sales strategy or something, and mm-hmm. I would say one of the things that you have to do is celebrate. You have Absolutely. to all of your accomplishments because what a lot of people do, part of them, 
part of it is I don't want to be blowing my own horn. The other part is, well, of course I was supposed to do that. That's not something mm-hmm. to celebrate. That's something I was supposed to do. Okay, great. But <clears throat> how many people aren't doing it? <laughs> you know, right. Maybe it was something you were supposed to do. You did it. Rock on. Acknowledge it. Because then you want to do more of it. It's, it's fully exactly. moving. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Well, and, and there, there's another piece of that where, you know, I, I, I when I'm doing workshops and doing things, I tend to stay away from the word goals because I believe that people have so negatively conditioned themselves to goals for exactly what we're talking about. They set that outcome for themselves. They set that result. They bust their tails to get there. And then when they get there, they do not celebrate the fact that they've achieved it. So they now have created an unconscious link that says not that big of a deal. So the next time that they set a goal, they are not as excited or committed to hit it because there was no reward when they actually went through all that crap that they went through to get there. You know, we have to take the time. We have to take the time, you know, to, to recognize, Hey, look, there was a lot of ups and downs in getting to the goal. And the other big thing about the goal is it's not about the goal. It's about who do you have to become along the way to achieve that outcome. And that part we need to constantly celebrate because, you know, this is the whole thing with the anatomy of transformation. You know, the person who's running a $32 million a year business right now, you're, th- that same person cannot run a $100 million a year business. You have to become a better leader. You have to become better at delegation. You have to become better at strategic thinking. You have to become a whole different person. And that's the thing. It's not about hitting the hundred million dollars. It's about who do you need to become? Are you willing to transform as an individual internally to be able to achieve those outcomes? And those are things to to genuinely celebrate because those things stay with you for life. Right. Wow. That's awesome. That just makes so much sense to me. Um, And I never would have thought of it that way. Uh, But Mm -hmm. but when you say it that way, there's such, uh, clarity around that and this idea that people that when you see people who are successful that 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 they started out that way I mean it's just silly right, right? yeah so it's just part of the reason why I like this idea of anatomy of transformation that there the really is this process to it now you I said in your um, introduction that um, in order for you know uh, people to be successful or businesses to be successful, they have to follow a repetitive cycle of yes. the anatomy of transformation. Can you explain that? Sure. Uh, change is inevitable. You know, economy is going to change. Your employees are going to change. You as an individual is going to change. Your health is going to change. So change is inevitable. Growth is optional. Again, that comes back really to that thing we were talking about with awareness, you know, just because change is happening, how many people do you know who are still trying to market themselves the way that they marketed themselves five years ago, but the economy and and everything has changed and they're struggling because they're not willing to change. Transformation is a choice. So it's recognizing that it's kind of like what we just said about with the goals. Transformation isn't the end game. It's who do I become through that threat journey. And when I get there, I'm now standing in a new place that says, okay, what's the next transformation? Now, it happens concurrently, but it also, excuse me, I, I may have used the wrong word there. It happens, you know, when, when you complete, you start again, but then there's also multiple transformations that are happening at the same time. The gentleman that I mentioned uh, before who lived in Italy, for him to transform his business and, and within 18 months, he did transform his business from 15 employees and $32 million in revenue. 18 months later, it was 63 employees and $124 million in revenue in 18 months. But to do that, there everything, he had to go through transformation. His C-level management had to go through transformation. The way that they, they actually did projects to, to clients had to go through every part of the company had to go through transformations and they were operating and going through different phases at different times. You know, so everything from, from your receptionist and the way that they answered the phone and, and, and promoted the brand to, you know, how the CEO was, was actually running things. All of that was going on 
I guess that's the concurrently would have been the, the correct word there. So it is a repetitive cycle. You know, I mean, as soon as you're finishing making a transformation in one area, then there's the next area that you discover that you're looking to transform and grow and, and move in. Or if you're, if you're looking at your business overall or your life overall, you may notice multiple areas that you are, are committed to making those transformations. Okay. I get it. Thanks. That now, now I yep. get it. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. I have to take a quick sponsor break and then I have more questions for you. Okay. Seller, your business growth podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. If you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash business growth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are 8020 Sales and Marketing by Perry Marshall and The Go-Giver by Bob Berg, both of whom have been guests on this podcast. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're talking with Willard Barth about the anatomy of transformation. So the question that I wanted to ask is, if there are, are, are there any situations um, that this framework, this anatomy do, doesn't apply? No. <laughs> it's, it's one of the things, one of the things that, uh, that led to me creating the framework that I did was again, the mentor who, who asked me the question that initiated the process then asked me another question as I was getting months into the process of identifying this. He threw a wrench in my uh, in my process at the time. Says I'm going to ask you a question, and uh, it was loaded because I had no idea what the answer was. He said, "What's the difference between Napoleon Hill, who all of us now uh, know with Think and Grow Rich and the Laws of Success and Outwitting the Devil and all these things, but at the end of Napoleon Hill's life, he was destitute." You know, he thought he was going insane because he couldn't make money and he had to move into the basement of a family member's house in West Virginia. What's the difference between him and W. Clement Stone, who applied the same principles and became just astoundingly wealthy by doing it? And I'm like, I, I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> and he said, Napoleon Hill was selling concepts. W. Clement Stone was selling systems. People will invest in systems. People will not invest in concepts. And I then thought about it with this, this thing that at the time had not yet been named the anatomy of transformation. I'm like, okay. So again, let me dig deeper. And rather than just come up with the general concepts of how I made those transformations and what I shared with my clients, let me come up with a system, a framework now, there are deeper layers of the anatomy of transformation, which I call the tactics that you plug into the framework and the strategies that you execute that allow you to use it for finances, that allow you to use it for your health, for your, for your sales team, for your business process maps. But the highest level of these seven phases that we're talking about, that framework, it overlays on anything. If you're looking to get healthier, well, first off, there's area in your life that you're ignorant. You may be ignorant of your diet. You may be ignorant of what the best exercise resource for you may be. You may be ignorant of some of the health issues that you have that you're, you're not even aware of that you could, you know, you could injure yourself if you started a diet or a workout regimen that wasn't correct for you. So you need to become aware. You need to you know, uh, uncover these things, whether that's by going and, and working with a personal trainer and learning these things or going to your doctor and having, um, you know, the examination done. And then when you have the awareness, then you have to take responsibility. You have to take responsibility for why your health isn't good right now. You know, why, you know, why your body's in the shape that it's in. Because when you take responsibility, again, saying it was my decisions and my actions that got me here, then you empower yourself to make the decisions and, and go forward. Then how, how, how immersed are you going to be in the uh, process? Are you going to try to exercise? 
you know, I, there's a, there's an exercise I do with people when I'm, when I'm in front of them where I will hold my phone in my hand and say, try to take the phone out of my hand. And one of two things happen. They either take the phone out of my hand or they leave it lay there because there is no such thing as try. You either do it or you don't. So how committed are you? We say we're going to try to do something when we know we're not fully committed to the process and we want to give ourselves a bailout excuse. Yeah. And then the next part is the interdependence. If I'm going to improve my health, I found out these things in the awareness phase that, you know, I need to be aware of, you know, my heart because there are some challenges there. Okay, I need to be interdependent with a cardiologist while I'm doing this as well as the personal trainer and the dietitian and the other things that I'm working with become interdependent with the experts who can guide me until I'm to the point where I know this stuff so well, I'm able to, you know, to, to do it without having to check everything with them. Again, it applies to your health. It applies to your finances. It applies to every component of your business. So, you know, the, the, there is nowhere that the anatomy transformation transformation framework does not apply. Yeah. Thanks for that. That, that, that's, um, I think I, I sometimes I wonder uh, if bells are going off in the listeners' heads, like they're going off in mine, right? Just by giving those <laughs> examples, and I think, okay, yeah, got that, got that. I see. Okay, that that makes sense to me. So, but but in in that same vein, because those examples are great, um, do you can you share uh, some of like the greatest transformations you've actually seen? Where sure. people, you know, use this process? Absolutely. Um, again, one of them that, that I talk about a lot is the company that went from the 15 employees and 32 million annual revenue to 63 employees and 124 million. That's the, that's the biggest number wise yeah. that, uh, that I, I speak about. Uh, there was a smaller business that they increased their revenues by 93% in one year by applying some of these principles to, to the marketing. You know, I mean, that was one of the main areas that we were focusing on as far as the transformation was we were focusing on, you know, what were they doing to re-engage previous clients? What were they doing to differentiate themselves from the competition, all these things. And in one year by again, going through those phases, a 93% increase in revenue. Uh, there's a doctor who, who worked with uh, myself and one of my partners on some things that, you know, in one month of applying some of the things that we taught them, they, uh, they did $45,000 in new business in one month. Um, I mean, there, there are lots of different examples that, that, that I could go into. So. Wow. So and that's, that's the beauty of, of, of what I like with the anatomy of transformation you know, it, it's the you know we get we always have those little uh, asterisk disclaimers that you see on the TV commercials. These results are not typical, and all that crap. <laughs> you know, and I I'm willing to say to people, you know, these results. Th- this is a proven system that's guaranteed to get results. The only variable in it is, are you going to work the system? Right. The system right. is guaranteed to get you results. And these results are, you know, they, they are typical. I mean, I've got clients who are getting them, you know, daily. I've got people who are contacting me from around the world. One, one that's not even, you know, as much a, a specific business one, but one of, one of that touches my heart the most is a young college student from India who, when he was first introduced to some of these concepts, he was going to a junior college. He had no self-esteem, no confidence, and he decided he was going to, you know, apply to this competition that was going on at the largest university in India. And although he did not win the competition, it opened up some other doors for him that within two years of when he he finally decided to take responsibility and, and immerse himself in some of these things, he went from being a student with no self confidence, no self esteem, no self worth at a junior college to running a lab at that largest university in India, working on a project that was approved by the number one scientist in the country and that was being funded by the Department of Defense to create an internet-controlled robot that would help 
first responders in natural disasters. Wow. You know, the kid went went from no belief in himself to running, having having the biggest university in the country give him a lab to develop this project, which he did end up end up developing, because he applied these principles, you know, in his life. And and the thing, hmm. the thing that uh, that I love, I mean, he's become a friend now. Is you know he he credits me and going you know you you changed my life. I'm like no you did. You're the one who applied these things. I just gave you a a pathway, a framework that that you chose to follow. But people, you know, transformation. I mean, that word itself, you know, whether it's a personal transformation or a business transformation, some of these transformations really are miraculous. You know, to take businesses where people are about ready to to lose their jobs and some of them are homes because the business is struggling so much. And then being able to have people really put these things into play and the business transforms and the business stays open and grows and the employees are now happy rather than going to work wondering if the place will be open, you know, in the morning. Those are um, miraculous transformations for, for a lot of places. Um, you know, it's just, sorry, I'm going, going off a bit of a tangent here, but. Yeah, it's great. But as you're talking about it, so now I guess my question is, <clears throat> how, thinking about these organizations that you mentioned, you know, that, that realized these great accomplishments and the, this great growth, I guess my question is, like, what situation were they in that got them – to seek change or or you, you know because like a lot of a lot of companies and a lot of small business owners they sort of get stuck in the weeds and they can't sure. be out of it to be able to say okay something you know that awareness thing something's got to change something right. just you know this this just what what i guess you know what happens there is it is it a uh, catastrophe? The, is it a stark? Uh, you know, what is it? Sometimes, you know, sometimes for the larger number of people, transformation only begins when there's enough pain in their life to drive them to do something different. You know, we, we as human beings, we do what's called, we default to familiar. You know, we take the easier path because it is familiar for us. Yeah. And this goes back to, to the 1600s when philosophers were first discovering that all human actions are motivated either by the desire to avoid pain or the desire to gain pleasure. And as people studied that more over, over the centuries, it also was, was learned that we do more to avoid pain than we do to gain pleasure. So example that I use a lot of times is standing in front of a room is asking, you know, what would people do to be willing to earn an additional hundred thousand dollars, and what would they do to prevent having a hundred thousand dollars stolen from them? You know, people people become more proactive to protect what they already have versus to achieve something they haven't gotten yet. So, for many of these businesses, what brings them into awareness is some sort of pain. You know, the pain of not being able to make payroll, the pain of, you know, a competitor coming out of nowhere and starting to take their clients, the pain of getting ready to, getting ready to or having lost some of your key players that allowed you to operate your business the way that you were operating it, recognizing that you'll never become truly a business owner because you're a business operator and you're going, I never came up with an exit strategy and you're getting to a place in your life where you're going, okay, you know, something's going to implode soon. So most of these businesses end up coming to, to the path of transformation when there's enough chaos and when there's enough pain in their businesses. People, people aren't, more rarely are coming to me because things are going great and they want to make it better. They're coming because yeah. things are messed up and they're, and they're looking for solutions. Yeah. So it feels like it's something that's catalytic. It, it's something that, so for example, I'm thinking about a company that's been operating <clears throat> for probably 30 years and it, it's never quite been at that place where the leadership would say, 
boy, you know what, we figured it out and this thing's humming like a top. It's just, it's always been um, a sort of a daily challenge, you know, sort of a thing. And they're either going to come to a point where, you know, they're going to lose a key player or something's going to happen or there's going to be the danger of it. Something's going to happen that's going to force them to make some changes that some people can see need to happen, but the leadership can't. Right. Yeah. And then that happens so often. I mean, uh, Steven Tyler, the, the lead singer for the band Aerosmith, but also one of the, the key songwriters for the band, he said something that I picked up on, oh God, I guess this is about 20 years ago, that I thought was phenomenal. And it applies to business as well as to the art of songwriting or anything else. He said, you know, when you are the creator, you tend to be right. You know, he, he was using the metaphor of painting a picture. He goes, you're a creator and you're sitting there and you're painting and, you know, you're there and your face is like six inches away from the canvas and you're so passionate, you're so into it. And it looks like all the colors are melding just the way that you want them and everything's beautiful. He goes, but the problem is the people who actually buy the painting because again, the only way that you make the living as the artist is if somebody's buying your product, the people who are buying it are standing 10 foot back and they've got a totally different view of how all those pieces are coming together than you do. But when you're the artist and many of these people who are business owners, they are the artists. You know, they are the people who, who created the business because the passion for what they do, they're so caught up in the art that they don't see what's happening with the bigger picture. That is a great way of putting that. That's awesome. I have to give credit. I have to give credit <laughs> to Steven Tyler on that one. So. <laughs> I knew I liked him for some reason. And <laughs> <that's just 'cause laughs> <of his. laughs> exactly. That's so great. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so this this may sound like a silly question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um. Mm -hmm. Uh, not really. So, I mean, the question that comes in my head is how quickly does this process happen? But that's not really, I guess my question is, is this a quick change? Is it something that, that happens over time? Does it depend on the person? Is it like a metamorphosis? What, what can someone expect if they say, okay, I, I got to do something? realistically, you know, like they say, real change takes 90 days. So realistically, mm -hmm. well, what is someone looking at as far as really being able to create meaningful change? You know, there, there are so many variables and variations in what it is they're looking to transform. Um, when I'm working with a business, I, I typically tell them it's going to, you know, it's going to take an 18, it's going to be an 18 month process when we're working with your business on something because it's going to take six months of us really getting in and doing the first couple of phases of, uh, you know, identifying what's going on. So we're working with the ignorance and the awareness part and starting on the taking responsibility of, you know, what are the fixes that we're going to be putting into play? Um, and then another six months of where, where is the level of immersion and interdependence on implementing these changes? And then it takes another six months after that to actually see some of the results show up. So to set realistic expectations, when I'm talking to a business owner, I tell them it's going to be about an 18 month cycle, but for an individual, you know, if you're not working with the business that has multiple facets and multiple components that you're working with, you know, that, that, that timeline can be shorter. I actually run something called the 90 day transformation challenge, um, you know, where, I agree with you that transformation can take place in, in that period of time. And that I, I don't know where they came up with this, you know, 21 days you install a new habit. I, I think that's BS. <laughs> I think it takes, you know, I think it takes longer than that to, to achieve that. And for, for it to become part of your operating system to truly become a way of being, because again, we just default to familiar too easily. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I believe, I believe that some of those transformations can take place in 90 days. It really is the question of how huge is the transformation you're looking to make, how committed are you to the process, and, and not only how committed are you, but how much time can you commit to the process. You know, many of the times that I'm working with a business, 
you know, the, the dance that we have to do myself and the owner and whoever the, the team is that we're working with is you already have a living entity that has its moving parts in play. So for us to come in and rework all of your business processes and your systems and all of these other things, you know, if we were going to be doing that and you did not already have sales in play and, and people that were working on things, you know, it would be a totally different game. So we're trying to not knock over the apple cart when we're coming in to make these changes. So, you know, how do you, how do you keep the business functioning while you're improving the efficiencies um, that are going on? So, you know, the amount of time, it really depends on what, what the transformation is that, we, that you're looking to achieve. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. That, that makes perfect sense. I mean, it, it's really an individual sort of, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, I want you to tell the listeners about um, your book and, you know, anything you got going on, how they can find you. But before you do, mm-hmm. if there was one thing that you wanted to leave the listeners with or one thing you wanted to make sure that they take away, what do you think that one thing would be? I would say become, become insanely curious. You know, again, I mentioned earlier that the the most successful people I know are constantly looking for that one idea, not because they're not fulfilled, because they're constantly looking at how can I make it's Tony Robbins, one of my mentors. He uses a a frame, uh, excuse me, a phrase called can I constant and never ending improvement. You know, so it's not about looking for I'm not good enough for that one idea for a solution. It's going, we're doing great. How do we make it one notch better? How do we raise our standards a little bit more? How do we become a little bit more efficient, a little bit more effective, a little bit more organized? And, and the people that, that uh, you know, I, I just love to be around are those people who are constantly, they're just insanely curious. They're looking for, you know, not to blame things, but what's that one little thing that's going to make a difference? What's that one little thing that's going to make it better? What's that one just what's that one thing? And when they find it, great, what's the next thing? And, uh, you know, it's an obsession for people. So I would just, that, that would be the, the one thing that I would uh, say to, to the listeners is just develop that, that, you know, that curiosity. How do things work? You know, I mean, anything that's around you, whether it's the, the key for unlocking a door, think about how do all those little components work in there? How does that how does that happen? Because when you're thinking about that, all of a sudden it's going to be a metaphor for other things in your business that you're going to find that you can learn from. So that would be, that would be my tip. That is so great. And you'll notice when I close out this podcast, um, listen to something that I say, I say at the end of every single one of my podcasts, because it'll resonate with you. So, okay. Uh, okay. So, so please share with my listeners, um, you know, how they can get in touch with you, how they can get the, your book, just, Sure. Anything sure. you need to know. Thanks. Well, the, the, the easiest way to get in touch with me is through my website, which is willardbarth.com. Uh, I'll spell out the Willard Barth part because many people still mistake my first name as William rather than Willard. So it's W-I-L-L-A-R-D as in David, B as in boy, A-R-T as in Tom, H.com. And uh, there you can learn all, all about the multiple different things I'm going, uh, got going on, my speaking engagements, uh, the, the business consulting that I do. I also run, we call it a coaching academy, but really it's a year-long program where myself and my partner who founded the academy, we teach how to be better leaders, how to be better at, at running life. We call it a coaching academy because really the, the, the way that you are being a leader is coaching and helping people to become better leaders themselves. Um, and then as far as the book, uh, a little bit more about the book, you know, we've talked and touched on the seven phases. There are actually two other modules that are part of the anatomy of transformation. Uh, one is what is called the three cornerstones for change. And then the other are the seven keys to success and fulfillment. You can learn about those in the book. Uh, and I actually have a, a special promotion going on right now that uh, is for your listeners that I will give you the book for free. You just uh, pay for the cost of the shipping and handling. And uh, if you're interested in that offer, uh, that's for in the United States only. If you're, if you're outside of the United States, contact them through the website and 
uh, you know, we can work out something similar to that, but we have a flat flat rate of what's going on for the shipping and handling here in the U.S., and you can get that at taotbook.com. So the uh, T, it's the abbreviation of the Anatomy of Transformation, taotbook.com. And again, I'll be happy to give you the book for free. Just cover the cost of shipping and handling. Oh, and you also, with the book, uh, you also get a copy of the ebook version uh, with it in that uh, in that promotion. Oh, how wonderful. Well, gosh, thank you for that. And thank you so much for sharing this whole idea. I think it is timely. Uh, it's the kind of idea that's evergreen, right? I mean, it's always someone mm-hmm. can always use it. Um, and, it and it's really a, a critical concept, I think, for really anyone, um, especially this audience, to really, you know, maybe take a closer look at and embrace and, um, you know, make sure that they're in a place of transformation so that they're always, you know, they're not getting stuck. They're always doing better things, whether in their personal life or their business life or both. So. Well, my pleasure. And, and thank you for, thank you for having me on. Thank you uh, for, for all of your questions. I mean, it was just an absolute pleasure to be able to spend this time with you and, and with your audience. That's so great. Uh, thank you. Right, right back at you. And uh, speaking of the audience, I'd like to thank our listeners. You're who we're doing this for. And our sponsor, uh, get a free trial and a free audiobook by going to audibletrial.com slash business growth. Continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Do you love news about LinkedIn, Indeed, Google, and just about every other recruitment tech company out there? Hell yeah. I'm Chad. I'm Cheese. We're the Chad and Cheese Podcast. All the latest recruiting news and insights are on our show. Dripping in snark and attitude. Subscribe today wherever you listen to your podcasts. We We out. out.